What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Bassist educator author David C. Gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist, revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. We welcome our listener back tonight for another irrefutable episode of Notes from an Artist. Hi, Karen. How are you? <laughs> According to the Old Testament, my name is Tom Semioli. I am your co-host along with my fellow apostle, David C. Gross. David, please address our audience member. Oh, uh, why? Is she clothed? <laughs> our guest tonight is Grammy Award-winning jazz bassist, composer, and former director of the National Jazz Ensemble, Chuck Israel. Now, Chuck has just released a book entitled Bass Notes, Jazz in American Culture, A Personal View, and that is available now on Backbeat Books. Now, David, we know Mr. Israel. He enjoyed a fabulous career with artists spanning Billie Holiday, Herbie Hancock, Stan Getz, to cite a few. However, he is best known to jazz fans around the world for his tenure in the Bill Evans Trio from 1961 to 1966. Wow. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're very impressed. Now, Chuck's a <laughs> <laughs> the legendary Scott LaFaro, who was tragically killed in an automobile accident uh, while still a member of the Evans Trio, Chuck came in and made some equally historic, or maybe not as equally historic records, but certainly was in a part of a very important uh, period in Bill Evans' career. Now, a uh, warning to our listener, Chuck, in his approach to assuming the bass chair following LaFaro and other topics, which you will enjoy, is kind of a reactionary or a traditionalist, if there ever was one. Don't you agree, David? Well, yeah, and upon reading reading the book, because remember our dear listener, we actually read the books cover to cover. I can handle things, I'm smart! I was a little miffed because it seemed that anything after 1967 was boring and persona non grata. However, the nice thing about an interview is we were able to exchange ideas. Yes, this is not CNN. We actually do have ideas. I'm going to make them an offer he can't refuse. The point being, I learned a lot. And one of the things I did learn, and, and I'm being serious about this, is that you can't, no pun intended, judge a book by its cover. Chuck really gravitates to the older forms of jazz. And that's his age group, so sure he would. But one of the things that I brought up that I think he actually got was the fact that I listened to jazz starting with Bitches Brew. And the fact that that was something that he never listened to really was an interesting feat because I said, I go backwards. The great thing about Bitches Brew is I go backwards. And I even said, frankly, I know probably more about early jazz than most people who even grew up during early jazz. Like I said, you can't judge a book by its cover. And really, Chuck got it. So, yeah, hooray. Yeah, we did reach him. You know, Chuck's book paints a vivid picture of what it was like to be a working jazz musician, especially in the 1960s as rock emerged and overtook jazz in the mainstream. I highly recommend Bass Notes. Again, in this interview, you hear Chuck is an intellectual who ponders his answers and gave us responses to our questions that certainly sparked contemplation, and even if we didn't agree with him. So well worth your while to check out this interview with Chuck Israels. Let us do the platform plugs, David. You, the audience member, Maybe listening to David and myself every Monday night on Cygnus Internet Radio, C-Y-G-N-U-S. You dial that up on the internet browser of your choice. You, the audience member, may be listening to us on our Notes from an Artist podcast, David, right at this mm. very moment, which is accessed on Apple, Amazon, Buzz, Sprout, Spotify, and wherever podcasts are podificated. You can go behind the scenes with Notes from an Artist on our Notes from an Artist YouTube page. Why do you have so many jokes? Because uh, I like my wife. I like my cigar, too, but I take it out sometimes. And be sure to log on to www.notesfromanartist.com to keep up with whatever we're doing at any given moment. David, following this discussion, I advise our listener to stick around for our Chuck Israel's playlist. Very, very wide variety of material on this playlist. I think they'll like it. All right. Take it away, David and Tom and Chuck. Let's officially introduce Chuck to our audience member. David, he is a jazz bassist. He's a composer. He's an educator. He is a recording and performing artist. You know his work with the Bill Evans 
Crutchfield, Billy Holiday, John Coltrane, Gary Burton, Cecil Taylor, Dan Getz. He's also a band leader with the Chuck Israels Trio, the Chuck Israels Quartet, and the Jazz Orchestra. And Chuck, you were director of the National Jazz Ensemble from 1973 to 1981. And mm-hmm. David Chuck is also an author. His new book is Base Notes, Jazz in American Culture, A Personal View. And that's out now on Backbeat Books, which you can get in digital and hardcover format. And I was lucky to find a publisher, I think. <laughs> you were lucky to find a publisher. Let's talk about the book. The key word is personal. David and I have had plenty of authors on and musicians who've written their autobiographies. And they say it's easy to write about other people. It's easy to write about characters in a song, but the hardest thing is to write about yourself. How did you set upon this journey? First of all, who knows me better? I didn't think that was difficult. No one is really uh, objective. Uh, the, the the definition of oneself is, uh, is sub- subjectivity. So certainly I'm writing from inside myself, but that doesn't mean that I don't see a reflection of myself against the outside world. I see that. I'm not ignorant of of that reflection. So I see some, at least some of my foibles and flaws, as well as my things I think of as my qualities. And I'm able to mix that into my life experience as part of humanity. I, I don't I don't find that particularly strange. or And I don't think I'm unique. I think a lot of people can do that. Anyway, it's hardly the subject of the book, but I really, in some some ways don't think the subject of the book is me of the book is my experiences and that's that's a little different my experiences with growing up in a particular cultural circumstance was i think quite extraordinary and beneficial and had a lot of luck uh, we all have struggles of course but generally speaking i think my life has been pretty has been pretty lucky your answer to that question got me thinking immediately about how many musicians or how many people who do buy uh, autobiographies on themselves use that quote unquote humble ethic of oh it's easy to write a song it's it's tough to write about myself. When you really mm-hmm. sit and think about that, even though it's not a part of bass notes, it's also, it's definitely a part of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, who's more interesting? <laughs> well, I think I am, but you know, that, that's me. Yeah. Well, uh, you know- what, what what strikes me about this book is just that fascinating glimpse into the life of a jazz musician of your era. Did you keep diaries by any chance? No. The only part of that book that was written in the moment that it happened or immediately thereafter mm-hmm. is the part of, is that story of that horribly difficult and ultimately funny the way impossible situations can be funny. That gig in Stamford, Connecticut that I wrote about that that's in a different font in the book. That's the only thing that was written uh, as it happened. The rest is memory and made up memories, as we all do. Just some of the revelations in this book that your value stems, your value system stems from your experiences with the Weavers and Paul Robeson, who were friends of your family. You were particularly affected in that they never compromised on what they believed in. Talk about the effect that had on a young Chuck. Israel. It's something I said two nights ago in the, in the book signing event that something came up about character and and uh, and I think there are certain elements, basic elements of one's character that happen some partly genetically and partly environmentally in your infancy, in one's infancy. I don't mean for a minute that no one develops or changes after that, but there are certain stamps that are on you real early uh, that you get from. Uh, genetics and family circumstance. And there there was a certain kind of principled kind of ethical standard that was set in my family environment that had a powerful effect on me and so powerful that I don't even think about it. The lines are drawn there there are there are boy you don't cross those boundaries. And again, it's not something over which I feel control. It can to a certain extent it's control by basic elements of my character that I inherited one way or another, genetically or environmentally. So being around the Weavers and Paul Robeson and my parents and other principled people, may it, it, those were people I admired. And they set the standard of behavior and outlook on, on things that you go against that, <laughs> you're not, you get real sick. You know, your sense of yourself and your sanity. 
part of you. It's woven into you, for lack of right. a better word. You mentioned in the book that your parents had European taste, but you gravitated towards American jazz. David and I talked to several British musicians about what attracted them to the American blues. And they said to us that they were drawn by its exoticism, that it was out of the mainstream and therefore intriguing. What was it for you, rebellious teenager, or was just more in tune with your generation? Hard to pin that down. Why do you like a certain thing, a certain food or a certain person or a certain certain music? I can describe the things about it that are attractive to me. Why they're attractive to me is a little bit of more of a, a mystery. Why do I love the rhythms of Charlie Parker so much and Bill Evans? Those are two particularly rhythmically inventive musicians. What is it about those rhythms? The fact that they that the rhythms are syncopated and distributed across the matrix of time in a way that interests me and makes my body feel light and alive and, and it reminds me in some, uh, this is going to sound too concrete and it's really an abstract idea, it reminds me of, of American body motion, of American dance, of, of what we have absorbed in our culture from the mixture of West African things and European things that come out to uh, uh, Martha Graham and Alvin Ailey and Gene Kelly and uh, Fred Astaire and and who are the brothers, uh, the Heinz, you know, Heinz brothers, yeah, the Heinz brothers and the and the oh the preceding ones. The, the I know Nick- exactly who you're talking about. I, I can't remember their names. The Nicholas brothers. That's it. That's it. Nicholas brothers. That movement is looks American to me. Although I don't dare to answer. It, it looks like. My body wants to feel like that. If it doesn't, at least it it imagines it wants to. Something familiar about it. It has the qualities that I love about my environment. Lots of things I like about having grown up here. Right now, I feel uh, we're in pretty much of a crisis of identity that, that disturbs me no end, but still makes me, I wouldn't want to leave unless I had to. I might have to, but I don't, I don't want to. Well, another one of the interesting revelations I thought was that you interpreted greatness as, or virtuosity as a natural talent, the God-given attribute, not the result of hard work, study, and practice, practice, practice. Yes. And you and had an aversion to practice. That was a mistake. <laughs> it was a mistaken view of the world and how that in. It's hard to go back and say why you had certain points of view as a child. You interpreted, you want, you know, one sure interprets things in ways that ensure survival, I guess. And for some reason, I I saw things that way. And part of what the book is about is uh, I was wrong. And I'm not averse to saying I was wrong. I've changed my mind. I see things differently. My experience has led me to draw different conclusions at different times. And at the same time, certain things have remained durable and stable. There's also I, something about growing up in Manhattan. There really is. There's a, a pervasive undercurrent of sophistication on so many levels. Dare I say books? That's something that for me is is an important component. I grew up a few years later than you, but on the 14th floor of my building was one of my mentors, a guy you probably know, a drummer who uh, you know, played with Charlie Parker, played with Woody um, Herman named Don Lamont. Oh, really? I don't know yeah. him personally, but I certainly know his playing and I, I and he and I cite him and his music when I talk to drummers as the guy who kind of invented the way of playing in the intricacies in the spaces between the hits of the band instead of only not only playing when the band gets loud and does something and makes a hit but playing in the spaces that precede that and preparing the the band and the listener's ear to expect that hit. And, well, and I he... was 12 when I met him, and he introduced me to the people who owned Manny's, took me to <laughs> Jim and Andy's, which you wouldn't be able to do now at my age going into a bar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I used to cut prep school and go to the ABC studio and sit by his hi-hat while he's playing for the Les Crane show. Now, my sister went to performing arts. Oh, and what, what prep school did you go to? I went to McBurney. Oh, I don't which know. Which was on 63rd between Central Park 
and Broadway. Everyone from uh, Jason Robards Jr. to who's the guy who did Nightline, Tom? Oh, gosh, I can't remember his name, but I know who you're talking about. Yeah, that guy. He he graduated there, too. Your sister went to performing arts when? when was that? Uh, I think it was 63. Okay, so not, so long. Yeah, not so long after. Yeah, and, and then she went to, because um, she started working, uh, so she went to PCS, because being a professional children's school, yes. it gave you the option to be able to get out and, and stuff like that. But we have one other thing in common, which, which I find hilarious. Hilarious. And that is the first day I got to Berkeley, I go to my bass lesson and John Nev says, Mr. Gross, the electric bass is not a valid musical instrument. <laughs> I thought you'd get a kick out of that. <laughs> However, Charlie Binakis well, disagreed. Uh, yeah, well, it's I, I call it different things, a weapon, a thunder stick. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, it's uh, yeah, you're allowed to be wrong, too. It's OK. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's interesting. That it's, John... a, it's, a, it's a very, it, it's an absolutely appropriate instrument for music that has only one dynamic. And that's, that's one of its problems. I think maybe its main problem is that it, it really, it has no dynamic shading. It And when I play, I've played it I've, in mm -hmm. commercial circumstances. It only feels as if it's giving you the kind of physical feedback, the sensation of playing something when it's turned up too loud. Well, I, I have to disagree with that because, well, a lot of my basses have been custom made. I mean, uh -huh. here we have a, uh, a six string fretless bass. Oh, and okay. So for me, I understand the age of what you um, grew up in and the music that you started listening to. I just find that I sort of ascribe to Ron Carter's philosophy in the big M that it's all music. And as Duke Ellington said, there are only two kinds of music, good music yeah. and the other kind. And I also, a turn, when, when you start out really getting involved, I was seven, clarinet. My sister took me to see A Hard Day's Night. I realized I am not getting laid playing a clarinet. It's just not going to happen. And so my parents got me an electric bass. That's how it was. And uh -huh. so I started I started playing in bands and things. But in 1969, something very important happened to me that happened to a lot of both talented and technically adept musicians, and that was Bitches Brew. Now, say what you want about jazz fusion, but for me, what jazz fusion did was it got me to listen to the earlier Miles records, which got well, me to listen to Birth of the Cool, which got me to listen to Charlie Parker. And quite frankly, I probably know more about the early days of music and TV than a lot of people that lived through it because it wasn't the first stop for me. Mm -hmm. But thank God that I had someone who gave me Bitches Brew record and moved me back. So with that kind of a, a history for myself, and of course, growing up in Manhattan and gigging all over town, it gave me the ability to look from not only a historical perspective, but from a perspective that allowed me to see music in the future that was maybe not challenging. I have a 19-year-old daughter. I have no problem with hating Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with most of the music she, she listens to. However, I think we all grow up at a certain point in time and at a certain point, we go back to that era because I think that's uh, that's absolutely been my experience looking at broader things than my own than my own. Yeah, that's, but I think it's the only art form, Chuck, where you can do that. I mean, if you think about it, you remember the first time you heard a song. You remember who you're with. You remember maybe even what you're wearing. Everything is so visceral in that. But if you go to the Louvre and you see the Mona Lisa, and then let's say 10 years later, you see a picture of it in a book, there is none of that. The music holds this something well, that... Well, there isn't for you and for me. Some people true. think are more, maybe more effective... I remember what I was wearing when I got at the beginning of the book. I think I start the book in a dramatic, with a dramatic moment in my life when I get the letter from my friend Paula Robeson that tells me that Scotty LaFaro had been killed. I remember what I was wearing. Yeah. I don't know that I remember what I was wearing any other time in my life, but I remember I had up on a particular jacket that I had gotten from a store called Casual Air that was on the corner of 4th Street and 6th Avenue, 6th or 7th, 6th, I think. 
no longer there, but a storefront is there. It's no longer that. But anyway, I, I remember yeah. that that moment was a powerful emotional moment for me. The first time I heard song, I don't remember the first time I heard Bill Evans. Hmm. I, I don't remember when when that was. I think I probably, it probably was a number of circumstances kind of jammed close together because wherever it was that I heard him first, I wanted to hear it again soon after. So there, there's a blur there. I have a, a Scott LaFaro question for you that's been since I, I read the book. And yes, Tom and I, we're weird. We actually read the books before oh, good. we talk to the authors. Oh, I hope you enjoyed it. Parts that are provocative and, and there are some great spots to it that I love. But I have a question about Scotty LaFaro that really intersects with your uh, practicing. Do you think that anyone can develop the technical facility of a Scotty LaFaro? Oh, no. No, no, I couldn't have. I, I mean, I was fast. No, no, I'm, I'm kind of shocked when I see videos or hear recordings of myself from 1964, how fast I was. I was playing every day and, and practicing whether I realized it or not, I was. No, I, I, I don't necessarily think so. I, I think people have different qualities and elements in their bodies and their minds that allow them to excel at particular things and not at others. Speed was never one of, never something I thought I had. I know I don't have it. Smart, I thought I had. And I thought, I think as many people do, that I would use the, would play to my strengths. But what would I mean more about when you, when you saw Scotty, did you go, ah, I want to get that fast? Because you know, no. a lot of young players do. Oh, yeah. And they don't sound very good either. Partly because, no, no. When I heard Red Mitchell, I thought, I want to sound like that. I want to. There's I want a great to quote in your about. book that you um, quote about improvisation and preparedness. I love that. That's Red, you yeah. know. Red was smart. I just saw his widow two nights ago. She came to the book signing. Oh, she, that's great. Uh, she's a lovely, lovely Swedish American woman, Diane. And he uh, played in fifths, right? He eventually tuned in fifths. He, when I knew him, when I first knew him, we were playing a normal bassist, and he was working. Uh, in, he was the principal bassist in the MGM Symphony when they had a studio orchestra, and there was a cellist named Edgar Lustgarten, very good cellist, who was the principal cellist, and they were playing the same parts an octave apart most of the time. And Red liked Edgar's phrasing and bowing. He said, "I want to be bowing the same way. I cross strings at different times because." So that was one motivation, the low C and the sound of the high A string. And he, and he went away. He stopped all his work for 10 days, went into a cabin in the woods and retrained his, himself and came back ready to play. I grew up as a cellist, so it's not, it's not mysterious to me, the tuning in fifths. It sure is a lot of moving. <laughs> there's a lot of this. Oh, this I have a hard enough time getting my fingers in the right position to know there's a whole step. I mean, there's a half step and there's a half step and I got it. But Red was great at target practice. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Would, and, I, and I know a few bass players like that. There's a bass player in the Boston Symphony, Larry Wolf, associate principal. I'm kind of dependent on fingering, on knowing which finger is going to play that note. It doesn't matter to Larry. He knows where the note is. He can, can put his pinky on it or his first finger or his thumb it's there and i'm measuring all the time using my using the shape of my hand to tell me where i am on the bass don't don't you do that too on the fretless bass Absolutely, absolutely. But one of the nice things I like about the six string bass is I can go down to a low B and I can literally do two full octaves in one position. Yeah. Which is great for reading. I like the Dot Sour books. They're a lot of fun to read through. And also things like Bach cello suites and, and yeah. stuff like that. It keeps your reading going. Sure. But I'm still at heart, I guess, a loud rocker. I love playing in front of people. I love uh, the music. And when you, when you think about Charlie Parker and a lot of bebop, there are really two major there are actually three major forms there's obviously the blues but there's the i got rhythm changes and there's the indiana changes and what's funny about it is the indiana changes to me and the rhythm changes it's all pop music oh, it's yeah. how they it's how they use and start thinking for me i don't think in scalar terms i think one three five seven nine eleven thirteen so i'm thinking both quarterly and chord tones of a, of a bass line i kind of like when and i know you don't really care for the modal stuff because you're staying in one place too long, as you say. 
But I think there's only 12 notes in all the ones that we hit on fretless instruments too. So there's a lot there that you can really see, or I can, improvisations, as long as you're, you know, sort of stating melodies and and doing something that keeps you in what whatever mode that may be, but gives you the ability to move around a bit. Huh. Did you read my book? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. And that's why I'm going this direction. Well, okay. There's no problem with modes. I have a problem with stasis. I don't have any problem with modes. I don't have any problem with thinking in scales or stacked thirds or as long as what comes out on the other side has the quality of built up expectations that are uh, not met about one third of the time. But that's, that's the structure of all things that take place into all kinds of art forms that take place in time. Something happens, it has to happen again. If it doesn't happen again, you don't know what it was. It happens again the second time you know it was important. The third time it starts, by the time you get through the end of that third time, something might ha should have changed so that you're a little surprised and, and moved forward. If that's in a in a drama, in a in a play, in a movie, in a in, in a in a song, and so but I do you really think that doesn't happen when when you're let's say I guess you were you were thinking uh, what was the uh, the tune where it was uh, so what the, so what the yeah. D minor to the E flat minor yeah. Well, no, it doesn't happen enough. It can happen in an improvisation if the improviser knows how to do that. My quarrel with, with that bare bones of form is that it doesn't have enough pegs to hang your hat on to guide you, to guide anyone who isn't already experienced in how to create melody and how to, how to make music work. In other words, it's perfectly fine for Miles Davis and Bill Evans and and Cannonball Adderley to have this wide open form because what they're going to plaster on it is already informed by Cole Porter. If you start a neophyte with that, who has no sense of phrasing, of two bar phrases, of, of shaping uh, melodies, and you start with this incredible, just open field blank page, that person doesn't know what to do. But don't you think the schools have gotten better at teaching form? I hope so, but I don't yeah. know. I have different experiences. I went to Helsinki a couple of years ago and found a group of musicians who were incredibly well-trained and well-prepared because the guy who started the program at the Sibelius Academy was a person who had a strong foundation himself and who understood the value of making that foundation essential and available to. And he was not uh, blown hither and thither by fashion. Get this, put this under you, then go do what you want. So my experience with those musicians Musicians, young musicians was extraordinarily good. We had a wonderful time together. I gone, went to Paris, went to Berlin and the conservatories there. And I find a few people who have that because of their own interest in it. But the built-in system of teaching really doesn't, uh, it doesn't stick to that. It gets too subservient to commerce, to the commerce of get students in here. Back in the days when I went to Berkeley, they had already use that as their model. Oh, They're yeah. Like yeah. 40, 50, 150 guitar players just lining up. And, uh, and yeah, college is a business. So that makes perfect sense. When I listen to some of the young bands today, the Wynton Mar you know, I even consider Wynton Marsalis a young band because when I hear him, I want to go back to listening to Art Blakey records and, and things like, do you think that, quote unquote, turning jazz into classical music has hurt it? I don't think it's hurt it as much as turning it into, uh, I don't think, oh, boy, what a question. Has it hurt it? It has no, we have no choice. It is no longer popular art. No choice. You either kind of freeze it in museum type circumstances and institutionalize it, which has its problems. I'm not, I have no quarrel with the idea that that is full of problems. You mentioned in the book, you comment on the changing audiences at the Blue Note. We we're just talking about jazz and its popularity. And you mentioned that jazz shows became more expensive. Audiences were less responsive. And that's very interesting. You comment at one time in American life, music was a normal part of the activity 
It was for doctors, blue collar workers, students. And I think back in my parents were not jazz fans, but I'll bet they saw you in the 1960s because they played. They went out with their friends who were jazz fans, and they went to the clubs that you played in. And like ja- jazz was a, a part of their social lives. Rock music overtook that. Obviously, yeah, trends and styles, and 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 of course it was you know different culture. But what should jazz have done now, looking back, to pivot to adapt to the times, or could it have? Not, well, not what it did. Let me go back to Bitches Brew. Or you, for you, it served a purpose that I think was wonderful in your life in giving a window backwards to what I consider to be something a, a, a more complete and more durable system of musical communication. For me, it eliminated a bunch of that. <laughs> it erased qualities that I was that were essential to me. But I can see how how it arrived in your life at a different time and served a, it, it looked different to you than it did to me. And I can, yeah. I can understand that. What should jazz do? What should have jazz done, let's say? What should it have done? Yeah. It, it, there was nothing for it to do. It didn't mm-hmm. need to do anything. What David was talking about earlier is the only thing it can do to survive, and that's to institutionalize itself. And as I said earlier, that has built in problems. It has built in problems in classical music. It has built in problems in anything that gets institutionalized that is no longer fluid in the sense of coming out of uh, of a, uh, a kind of spontaneous community uh, creative effort. As soon as you put it in a museum, it changes it. It's no question. At this point, we have no choice because the audience for that might understand what Charlie Parker's language was, or Bill Evans's language, or Duke Ellington's language, the audience is minimalized. It's marginalized. I got a Grammy sitting up there in the corner, 2018, uh, for for a project I'm not terribly fond of. But I was at the at the Grammy Awards because our daughter wanted to go. And it was a nightmare for me. And Billie Eilish won everything. And and Lil Nas and I mean, there was no music. It was it was infant everything was infantile. Really, really infantile. And in that kind of circumstance, it requires education. Jazz, full communication requires an educated audience. For that, I commend Winton. He was smart as could be about that. He went right to the high schools. The first thing he did was inundated the high schools with good material that they hadn't had before and made a contest out of it. It institutionalized something that had been normal and natural before. Do you think that bebop, you know, and, and folks say this all the time, that bebop turned music from dance music to listening music and it created a kind of click of listeners oh we listen to bebop this that and that may have had something to do I mean you can pinpoint Charlie Parker's band and Louis Jordan's band oh sure that's where the split happened agreed Uh, yeah I do agree with that but there are people who live in a more who live comfortably in a more complex with more complex input into their consciousness and and okay you asked at the beginning about writing about myself here I'm going to talk about myself I am an elitist in certain kinds of music and I don't have that kind of room for complexity in my food other people do they can go to these fancy restaurants and eat all kinds of things that please it's too complicated for me I'm not only only meat and potatoes, but any you know nobody is anymore. I hope it, but I I like simple foods. Yeah. I like more complex music up to a point. So your reference to the complexities of bebop and to me it does not eliminate the dance part of it. It makes the dance part of it. And I was talking about that earlier. I like the rhythms of it. It's to me, it's dance rhythm. It's just a fancier dance. But there's no question that an aesthetic that encompasses more complexity is harder to understand and therefore eliminates a part of the audience. Basketball, football, other kind of football, soccer, rugby, lacrosse, baseball, polo, water polo, hockey. Which one doesn't belong? There's only lacrosse, one. That I picked one that I didn't win. What is it? A water I'll polo. Same thing. I'm yeah, get- basketball, football, soccer, lacrosse, baseball, polo, 
water polo, hockey, rugby. There's only one of those that doesn't belong formally in terms of form. That's a very good question, dude. Well, you, you figure baseball, lacrosse, and hockey all have sticks? Form, form. Oh, form. Well, baseball is the only one that you stop. That's the- right. Baseball is the only one that has any other form. The, all the others are the same form. They all capture the flag. Okay. All those games are capture, capture the flag. That's great, Chuck. <laughs> It's even better that I got it. <laughs> there is hope for you, David. <laughs> so my, my point is, now let me follow that through a little bit. Only take a minute to do it. Imagine, it's hard to imagine for us because we grew up with it, but imagine someone from I don't know where in the world this is left anymore. How about like, Mars? Well, okay. We need something almost as far as that. Imagine someone growing up in a culture in which there is no baseball and you show them a baseball. They don't get it. They can, they get minimal aspects of it. The guy with the stick hits the ball or doesn't hit or misses the ball. The guy catches the ball or doesn't catch the ball. Why is he running this way? I mean, there's all kinds of things that are completely obtuse that you, you have. What, the way I look at cricket, I have no idea what the hell's going right. on. Right? Baseball is. Right. If you cannot be a casual fan of baseball, you you have to understand the nuances nice. of the game. Whereas basketball, you put the basket and the ball goes in the net. Right. For it's, a point. It makes sense. Capture the flag. The other yeah. team is opposing you. You have to get across the field and get something over there. That's mm-hmm. that, all right. of those games are that. And you can appreciate them on a basic level, although adding nuance to it and understand details of the rules help you appreciate it more. But basically, you get it right away. Complex music is like baseball. It has rules. You have to learn to expect certain things. And then those things have to show up or they have to not show up. And the sequence of them showing up and not showing up is critical in your in carrying you through the drama of understanding where you are in time and relating to your experience as a human being on earth and time passing and your body on the ground and all of these things that music is some kind of strange metaphor for why it is the way it is, I don't know, but it seems to be that you have to know the rules. So what should jazz do? It should teach people the rules. That's it. That's all we can do. And that's what Winton got right. He absolutely got that right. No question about it. And I have my irritations with him. I've known him since he was a kid. And I, you know, there are things about him I like a lot and things about him that piss me off. But pretty hard not to be pissed off at someone that holds all that power. That's, true. That's how I feel about Tom. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have the recording device on the, yeah, uh, that's the it. Chuck, reading this book, I listened to music throughout your career. I wasn't familiar with your music before, but I listened to it on a streaming service. What are your thoughts on this platform now that I can get access to every, your career from George Russell all the way through to the present day? Huh? I don't know. If I thought about it, it has any effect on life. Yeah. Any, it's there. It's immutable. I mean, it, it's. Uh, you know, I can't turn back the clock. It has destroyed the easy access has it's a two-sided coin right the best of times the worst of times it's yeah, great that i can listen to all your work right. however and, yeah. yeah i don't get anything from any of it i mean just mm. it's just all there all accessible so i suspect that i will puny royalties that i'll get i will get more royalties from this book than i get from right. because more people understand english and because you have to buy the book and it is and even though there are PDFs do exist of it. They're not distributed. You can't know. Not everybody in the world can push a button and get right. of this book. When that happens, then publishing will get this publishing of books will get destroyed as well. Mm-hmm. And who knows? I can't fight that. So the general philosophy is that one adapts to that. And that's fine. Certain things are adaptable. And those things that are adaptable ought to adapt. Certain things don't adapt to that new circumstance of ignorance. The circumstance of ignorance. My music will not adapt to ignorance. It can't. You have to know the rules in order to appreciate it. And everyone knew the rules when I was a kid. I don't know if I said this in the book. I think I did. I grew up in Cleveland Heights, you know, right. they, 
talked about growing up in Manhattan, and I was in Manhattan too as well, but junior high school, I was in Cleveland Heights. And the kids that I grew up with, it was 1948. So we knew all the Cleveland Indians baseball players because they were the champions. I can still tell you who all the guys were in all the positions on the team. Who was the catcher? Jim Hegan. Oh, wiki that. Those same kids also knew the first chair players in the Cleveland Symphony. That was a good community. That was good. And that was before television. Pretty much. TV just uh, started. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, just start. Yeah, yeah. You 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 make an allusion to that in the book where you where you talk about the sixties that we stopped discussing complex issues and we replaced with slogans. Think of how long ago they banned cigarettes from commercials, and you and I still know. If I go, Winston tastes good. Oh yeah, and LSMFT. And that's right. That's Paul right. Philip Morris. And- Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. Winston tastes good like a cigarette shoe. LSMFT, LSMFT. Lucky strike means fine tobacco. Call for Philip Morris. A silly millimeter longer, <laughs> which has, you know, many, many different connotations today. But, <laughs> but you know what's funny, Tom? You know, you think about the streaming aspect of things. Streaming versus listening to, let's say, Eric Dolphy in Europe or Cecil Taylor, Blues in the Abstract Truth, Trio 64. It's like the cliff notes of music. You're not hearing the whole story. If you have an exam, you can cram for it. You got all the bullet points right there, but you don't have the whole story. Yeah, I don't know what to do about this. I live in, I feel as if I'm living in a kind of an isolation. I feel isolated in a way that I haven't before. And it's been quite a long time that I've felt this way. I have, don't know what my defense against that is. I really don't have one. I need friends, you know. I really, talking to people like you guys who are actually interested in thinking about these things is uh, revitalizing to me. Makes me feel uh, at least there's some sense to having had these experiences and drawing from them what I, whatever it is that I've drawn. Essentially, I wrote this book for myself in order to organize my own thoughts. What has been the feedback from your colleagues? Oh, it's been very good so far. I have had no, I uh, have only had, had people tell me that they enjoy it and that they appreciate my writing, that, that I'm a good writer. I knew that to begin with. Why did I know it? Because I write and then I look at it as if I didn't write it. My mother taught me how to do that. Uh, my mother was a good editor of no. her own material, but of other people's. I'm a better editor of my own material, although I can also use some help. I write and then I remove things. It's a good method. Yeah, I take out as many words. Anytime I could t- remove a word, I do. But I write and I let the excess flow it's okay. Then I go back and I refine it. And I sometimes things turn out right in the a sentence or two will flow and I leave them alone. But usually I can take something away. Anytime I say it's something is very this, I just say something is this. Like playing too many notes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, congratulations on a great book. What's that? <laughs> it's very bad. <laughs> and that's one very you can say. <laughs> congratulations. So you doing more book signings? Anything we can talk about we can plug for you? Uh, I don't think so. I just would hope that people would read the book with a sense of trying to position it in where it sits in history and how our culture has shifted and what you can do. The only thing you can do about it is to be educated. What should we do? We should learn things. I've had people come to me, talk in the book about Paul Simon, who came to me in order to gather musical information and actually took the information and learned it and was unafraid to confront the fact that there were some things he didn't know. Right. Yeah. You speak well of him. And I I enjoyed the uh, ice cream parlor anecdote. Yeah. (laughs) Friendly in Lee Mass. Uh, (laughs) He's a nice guy and very smart. And the guy you see on TV, that's him. It's really, it's, he's that very relaxed, very smart, very gracious, good humored person. It's a refreshing uh, read in the sense that, you know, we were inundated with pundits who weren't in the room. But you were in the room. So your reflections yeah. matter. Well, I, then I had other people come to me after Paul wanting to learn, you know, wanting to know the secrets who didn't really want to know the secrets because they were hard. Paul well, didn't didn't phase him that it was a little bit hard. Carly and uh, James, yeah, mm. when they were married. 
Farley, I knew when she was a kid. Uh, uh, right, you mentioned. They went, when I went to visit them and they asked me about this stuff and I told them what it was that I had, gave them a general picture of what I had shown Paul. Now, that was too much for them. They didn't really want to Paul, musical information and more things to know, more choices to make, more ways to, in, to, to develop music. Please show me. Absolutely. Well, Chuck, thank you for being a guest. Pleasure talking and, and congratulations yeah, on a great talking. book. Great seeing you, Chuck. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Fantastic interview with Chuck. David, let's talk about the Chuck Israel's playlist. What have you got? Well, for before us? we do that, there are a couple of things that I think were really, really important in this interview. Well, you know my feelings to the Wintonization of jazz. Oh, yes. A date which will live in infamy. Chuck makes a few good points about Winton giving everyone, quote unquote, the rule in terms of education, high school programs, school programs and stuff like that. And yes, that's a great thing. The obstacle that I still face is he has a very classical approach to jazz. And the problem with that is right with all of the things that go wrong with narrow-minded thinking. Mm -hmm. So, Wynton, if you're listening, we'd like to have you on the show, because I'd like to discuss a few things with you. Why is fusion and the avant-garde not really thought of in your lexicon of education? There you go. I, you know, we can also team uh, Wynton with Mick Morris from Motley Crue. I think that'd be a nice show. I'd like to have I think that would be great, but maybe get Lita Ford in on it as well. Well, now you're talking. Anyway, let's get it on with the Chuck Israel's playlist. Tom, um, this is really a phenomenal playlist. And I'll tell you why. Because I picked it. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. But actually, there is a wealth of incredible material. Who puts Eric Dolphy, Bill Evans, Stan Getz, George Russell, the Cronus Quartet, Chuck Israel's solo work, Bob Minster, and who puts that together with Judy Collins and Phoebe Snow? <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Let's get it on with Chuck Israel's playlist. Thanks for listening. My name is Tom Simioli. And you again, sir? David C. Gross. And have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>